Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Compliance Online Live Webinar: Writing an Effective SAR Narrative. Our speaker for today is Doug Kuiper. He is a certified anti-money laundering specialist (CMS) since 2005 and a former Bank Secretary Act officer and a compliance officer for a dollar 800 commercial bank in Atlanta before it was sold twice in a year. We are going to talk about suspicious activity report narratives, and it is one of the most talked about topics at the anti-money laundering training classes at the Community Bankers Association of Georgia for both the beginner and the advanced level classes. So always something that people talk about and no matter the size of the institution, you're always looking for some insight as to how to make them better. So we're going to get to all of the different elements of the narrative and how to make them almost to a template, but it's more of what you put in it and why you put in it so that as you train your staff, you'll have a methodology on how to train them so that your narratives are consistent throughout your institution. Anytime you talk about money laundering to your staff, you got to make sure you use the words placement, layering, and integration. So when you're training your staff on how to write a SAR, make sure they have the mentality of, we are documenting either placement, layering, and or integration. And so with those three things in mind, where does this narrative or where does this suspicious activity fit in? Well, when do we file a SAR? How big is this? case. I mean, this is only a couple thousand dollars or 15,000. It's not worth me writing it up. Well, it, maybe it is. So whenever I've talked to Bank Secrecy Act officers and was one in the past, I would tell people, when in doubt, write it. Just get it into the system so that that person, because you may write one for $5,500 and you think it's a waste of time, but what if 10 other banks all did the same thing? All of a sudden, law enforcement can start to cast a wider net and get a better vision of what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. So insider abuse, any amount from a penny, when you get this slot, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> when you get this slide deck, you will be amazed. All right, rule number one, don't assume the reader's familiar with your bank or credit union's terminology, acronyms, slang. You know, it went to the downtown branch or the Peachtree Corners branch. You've got to give them the address and more information. You can also put the branch information on the SAR form. So in your transactions, most SAR uh, software, will have all of that branch information in there. And so all you have to enter is the branch number and it will add the address of the branch to it. Narrative makes the difference determining whether the conduct is clearly understood. So you want to describe the factors that make the transaction or activity and if you fail to do that, you truly undermine the purpose of the SAR. Get to the five W's and the how. So this is pretty obvious. The who is going to be in the form itself, name, address, emails, phone numbers, gender, and we'll cover why that in just a moment. We've got the address, where the activity took place, all the different branches, Etc. You want a brief statement of SAR's purpose, describe the known violation, three to five sentences. We don't need three to five paragraphs, three to five sentences. Get to it. 
identify the date of any prior SARS file and the purpose of those SARS. So if somebody had unusual wire transactions and now they're having unusual cash transactions, well, that may be painting a bigger picture. So maybe they had unusual outgoing wires, but now they have unusual incoming cash. Well, this may be a different type of income stream or different type of business within the same company or corporation. So you can just imagine how that would work out. The source of funds during the investigation had payroll. Well, that's good. That makes them a legit uh, worker at a real estate firm. He had payroll. He had 35 checks, totaling 32,000, 42 cash deposits. Well, that's kind of weird. I don't know many people who get payroll and checks and cash deposits all into the same account. That's highly unusual. The cash deposits, I like to go ahead and just do this calculation myself, just to put it out there. This makes cash deposits 57% of his total credits. Because if this $142,000 was only 3% of his credits, maybe we don't care. Maybe on this particular person, this $142,000 is not suspicious. If the cash deposits are 90% of total credits, oh, holy mackerel, that's a whole different story. So that's just a nice little way to differentiate and strengthen what we think is unusual about this activity. When we format this narrative, this is something that you can work on with your staff if you're reviewing the SAR narratives before they go to FinCEN. So you want to make sure they're clear, concise, chronological. We don't want to go back and forth in the story. We want to start at the beginning of the story and go to the end and not repeat ourselves and make sure we get the complete who, what, why, when, where, and how. So here's case number two. SARS being filed on ABC Bank customer John Doe, employee referral, so now we know where it came from, unusual wire activity. He's been a customer since February 2nd, 2018 in Dallas, Texas, listed as a manager at a grocery store. Man, in two sentences, we covered a lot of detail. This is his first investigation into his account. Further research revealed between March and May, he received 172,000 in wires from high-risk countries. Whew. 